I would now like to bring to the stage, we're going to have um, three people come up to the stage. We've got Pentland's Brand, uh, Joyce Fong, who's the Corporate Responsibility Manager for Asia, and she'll be joined by uh, Israel Institution, uh, Israel Institute, um, uh, Anders Lisberg and Cha, who is the uh, Director of uh, Business and Human Rights, and Cha is the um, Country Director for Myanmar. So welcome. Good morning. I'm Joyce Fong from Penland. Thank you for allowing me and my partners, Isara Institute, to take part in today's conference. So uh, I'm a buyer, so uh, our company, Penland, is actually a family business, and we own a lot of brands. Uh, not a lot of brands, some brands, and also we license some of the brands. So we manage all the brands, and we have a lot of suppliers that producing for us. So we need to be clear on ourselves where is our company stands. So our suppliers need to follow on our requirement. So what we are doing is like we we have a very clear policies about my, uh, modern uh, slavery that is unacceptable for us. And we need to have our standard, our policies that told our suppliers that the uh, supply chain need to be looked into uh, what happens, what is the risk at the, at the factories. And then we have create our uh, vulnerable workers policies to make it more clear about how we tackle on modern slavery. And as what Adidas also mentioned, Adidas uh, mentioned that we have our uh, due diligence to audit our factories, but we also find that we need to have more resource to work on this part. And then we also have training provided to our staff and so that we have our eyes and ears as factories and our supply chain who told us what our uh, CSR team need to do to work more hard on this part. So I, I'm not going to go through details, but because of the Modern Slavery Act that is in, uh, happened in 2015 in UK, who drive our companies to think more deeply about what PANA should do and how we can work more closely and comply with the law requirement. With the law requirement, there is a section about transparency in supply chain. So we are thinking that are we doing enough and should we be doing more? Our first step is to mapping our supply chain. And then we know where we are sourced from. And at the moment, we are still working on tier one, which for us is the Katso and uh, assembly factories. And then we are knowing that there are more risks at lower level, but we are still working on it to see where is the risks are. To start the program, we are working with Lanchester University to see the countries that we are sourced from, what is the risk as the country. Because some factories may be at the locations that is more advanced, that don't really have a lot of issues on modern slavery. But as we are sourcing from the low cost or some of the countries that is not having a lot of resource or a lot of things that we think they should have, and then that's what we find that there, there are risks. So we are consolidate on our tier suppliers and do the mapping, and then we calculate the country risk. We also collect data from factories to see, okay, are they using migrant workers? Are they in a lot of issues about the child labor, or issues on the uh, excessive hours? Those kinds of things are indicators for the modern slavery issues. So uh, throughout our journey, we are still doing the, our due diligence process to audit our factories, to understand the basic issues at the factory. Because of the Modern Slavery Act, we are looking into more on our policies. Should we be doing more? Besides our regular, our standard policies, we are in developing our vulnerable workers' policies to make it more strong with our policies to our suppliers so they understand what we need. And then we are conducting training within our internal team and also for our staff on site. So they are facing factories. 
they should be able to tell us what happens there and how they can see some risks at our supply chain and then they can feed back to our CSR team. And then in 2016, we start to do a deep dive into our, fact, uh, our pilot factories to see what is the risk are. And what we did is different from our regular audits. We have included our recruitment agencies at the factories. We invite them to the factories and then ask them, in, uh, interview with them to understand, okay, how do you recruit? What is your recruitment process? And then we have the um, bring along the uh, interviewer who can speak the migrant workers language, which, which have the uh, uh, Burmese, which is from the Miyama workers, and then Kuma from the Cambodian language, and also Thai. So all those uh, interviewers can speak those migrant workers language. And then we recover a lot of uh, information from them which is different from the regular audit's findings. And then we find out a lot of issues, so that's why we, we include our partners, Isara. So here is some of the findings that we want to share. Uh, a lot of this is based upon the recruitment process policies. So it's like, because in before, we are just asking the factories, what is your recruitment process? And in this time, when we are including the recruitment agencies to ask about their process. So the difference is we include the uh, Thai recruitment agency and we also including the Myanmar recruitment agent, uh, agencies. So those the sending, company, sending countries and the receiving countries uh, recruitment agencies review a lot of information that we never have before. So, and, and that's why we find that, oh, okay, we actually miss a lot of parts where, during our regular audits. And then also from the workers, they are saying that they are paying recruitment fees to some unofficial people, like the HR staff, also some, some ones that may be from the introductions on, on, on the part. Uh, in the factories, they have a worker's interviewer, uh, a worker's interpreter, who help to translate the language, but they are also taking part as an agency, and then the commission from the workers about the recruitment fee. So workers need to pay them to introduce them to the, the factories. As they cannot speak the local language, they can only rely on the interpreter to tell them what's happening at the factories, and that's why they pay them. But it is not supposed to be uh, not allowed to be in our policies to pay those kind of recruitment fee from the workers. And then we find out a lot of issues on uh, grievance procedures and also uh, factories also implement some uh, requirement, limited the access on the bank book. We, we said we don't, allow, uh, we don't allow for the withholding passport, but they withhold their bank book so they cannot go to, the go to the bank and get their money. And they need, to, they need to go through the factories to get the money. So those are the interesting uh, information that we get and we think that we need some more uh, process for us to remediate on the issues. And that's why we bring our partners, Isara. And I'll, I'll pass it to uh, Isara to introduce their inclusive monitoring system, how they can help us to remediate on the issues. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation from uh, AI, and also uh, thank you for being on stage with Pentland, who is a great partner. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here in uh, Hong Kong. It's uh, one of my favorite cities in uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, sorry, uh, Southeast Asia, so, uh, or East Asia. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the solutions on the ground and what we do uh, practically to address some of these uh, challenges that we have just talked about in the previous sessions. Uh, I started working on trafficking and issues like trafficking more than 20 years ago. Uh, I was uh, in Asia. Uh, at that time, most people uh, were focusing on trafficking for sexual exploitation and so on. Uh, but it was surprising to me to see that how few were addressing trafficking into labor exploitation. 
I went in to see factories at the time that looked like prisons with uh, more than 200 workers uh, basically locked in, locked up. Uh, you had uh, four meter high fences, barbed wire, you had uh, guards with pump guns in this case and all uh, to keep people in. And you had the workers been working there for two years uh, in export businesses and uh, nobody really addressed that at the time. Things have changed and we have improved a lot uh, since because uh, at that time nobody knew really what trafficking was or modern slavery. Nobody used those terms and that's changed. Today we are here all together because we are talking about some of these issues too. We have uh, legislation, we have international uh, standards and conventions and so on. We know it's a risk in global supply chains and we also know how to address those risks in a way. Uh, so we do have, uh, things have changed over time and uh, we, I will talk about how we actually address that, uh, those risks on the ground. So um, let me see how it works. I'll start out showing a video of uh, how we operate because I thought that would be a good way to present uh, the way we work. So we'll start out with a four minutes video to introduce. I hope it works. Human trafficking and forced labor. Today in 2017, most Western citizens, consumers, governments and businesses have a sense of how we may all be touched by human trafficking and forced labor. From the people who grow and package the food that we eat, to the people who make the clothes that we wear and the products that we use every day. We have a sense of how we may be possibly touched by human trafficking and forced labor, but we don't know exactly how. How is this possible in today's information age? Complex global supply chains obscure connections between us and the producers at the other end of our supply chains. Even to produce a single bag of shrimps, there could be hundreds or thousands of migrant workers involved across fishing vessels, small fish meal plants, aquaculture farms, and processing factories, all different businesses located in very different localities. Across Southeast Asia, these jobs are often filled by migrant workers. Migration to work in low-skilled industries is generally known to be a positive strategy overall for the millions of migrant workers and their families, and also for the businesses producing the foods and products that are exported to Australia, Europe, and the Americas. So within all these opportunities, but also risks, we need to support more of the good business practice that creates exploitation-free jobs and growth, and we need to find and end the human trafficking and exploitation. Not all labor risks in supply chains are human trafficking, but it's absolutely clear that there is still forced labor and human trafficking in global supply chains, and it affects millions. All of these migrant workers, and tens of thousands more each year, were able to get assistance by calling the ITSRA hotline or through ITSRA's smartphone app, Golden Dreams. <laughs> As of 2016, over 90% of Burmese migrant workers and 50% of Cambodian migrant workers have smartphones, and these numbers are climbing rapidly. New smartphone-based technologies are empowering migrant workers and connecting them to critical information and assistance in ways that have the potential to really disrupt entrenched exploitative brokering systems, which rely on job seekers and migrants having limited access to information and limited networks. ITSRA is able to help resolve these issues because of our strategic partnerships with businesses, ongoing relationships with global brands, retailers, and importers in the Americas and Europe who have joined forces with us to have a partner on the ground to help their suppliers identify and resolve issues, improve remediation, and transform migrant labor recruitment and management practices. ITSRA Institute's team of Burmese, Cambodian, Thai, and international technical staff on the ground have in-house expertise in everything from business advisory services to trafficking victim counseling to predictive risk modeling. We use empowered worker voice and data analytics to transform how businesses identify and address labor abuses in their supply chains, while at the same time empowering migrant workers with better information, better options, and better services to help migrant workers find and choose good employers, decent fair work, and safe living conditions. 
So within today's complex global supply chains, how can we know how we're touched by forced labor and human trafficking? How do we identify the risk points and work with suppliers to remedy them? How do we know how to make things better for workers who may be on the other side of the world? Listening to worker voices, finding a way to hear them across complex supply chains is a good start. Uh, I hope I think that's a good way of introducing how we work so you can see a little bit uh, what's going on on the ground um, who we are first of all like I am the director of uh, business and human rights at Israel Institute I have a background working on these issues as I mentioned for the last 20 years I, I've been in ILO uh, for many years six years I was in ILO in Asia also addressing these issues I've been working for the police uh, back in Europe. Uh, I'm originally from Denmark and I worked with the Danish government also in the last four years I spent with the Danish government working in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, also uh, working with the private sector and engaging with the private sector as more private sector and business people are getting uh, concerned and involved in, uh, in addressing these issues and so on. So we are an American-based NGO, uh, uh, sorry, an American-registered NGO but based in Thailand and Myanmar. And uh, our aim is basically to uh, improve working conditions in global supply chains and do that in partnership with businesses and uh, to help businesses reduce and manage the risk of hidden forced labor, et cetera, uh, in the supply chains. So even we are an NGO, we actually more working like a business in a way uh, as we have a, a very clear no name and shame policy uh, and we are working with major global brands uh, to address these issues, uh, to redu reduce the risks and so forth. Um, so our program is basically uh, uh, consists of uh, three, uh, or consists of three major components. We got the ISRA labs where we have uh, data analysis and we uh, anal analyze the situations on the ground, the risk factors and so on. We got what we call the Business and Human Rights Department, identifying uh, the labor risk and so on, and I'll get back to that through what we call the ILM, the Inclusive Labor Monitoring. And we got a Freedom of Choice program, which is basically providing assistance, direct assistance to victims. So we started a couple of years ago, but we have been growing quite fast. Uh, uh, so we already uh, now are covering different sectors. We started in the seafood industry, where there was a lot of uh, challenges into the uh, seafood and food processing in Thailand mainly. And we have now also recovering like other agricultural areas, uh, poultry, and uh, recently we moved into garments and footwear. And that's why we are partnering up with Pentland in that case. So our model is basically consists of three different uh, uh, components. Uh, first, what we call worker voice, and I'll get back to what that means. Uh, how we use worker voice to empower workers and get information from workers, and how we uh, then uh, use that information uh, and analyze that information uh, and work on technical solutions on the ground and remediation and so on. So hopefully that should be a kind of a triple win. It's improving the conditions for the workers, it's reducing the risk for businesses, and it's also uh, improving uh, the conditions in general, uh, which is also uh, uh, is, uh, an interest of the governments and so on, where we work. So the way we uh, engage with workers directly is through multiple different channels. And one of them is direct outreach, so we go meet the workers uh, at the factories, uh, at the canteens, at the housing areas, and that's a big difference. We are on the ground, uh, and we have outreach teams who uh, work in local languages. We have a helpline uh, and a hotline uh, also that runs 24-7 in local languages, so workers can call in and report on issues and so on. Um, we got what we call uh, uh, Golden Dreams, an, an app, which is basically uh, a kind of a trip advisor for workers so they can report, uh, they can send alerts, and they can also rate recruitment agencies and the workplaces and so on. So through that, we generate a lot of uh, information that we can uh, transform into business intelligence and that can help us uh, let us uh, inform the businesses and global brands about the risks. And we also uh, work, uh, there are different kind of social media platforms that we use. So we have like uh, more than 85,000 followers on Facebook and so on. And we have closed chat groups and so on for workers in local languages that they can report in on. 
So all of that we call worker voice, and basically it's all about, I don't know whether maybe we can have a discussion about what worker voice means. It means different things for different people in different organizations. For us, it's, it's about capturing the voices and experiences and, and, uh, and make that into a clear mechanism for remediation for workers. So that's a, a very important component. And the model that we call the ILM, Inclusive Labor Monitoring, basically uh, looks like this. So what you see there is like uh, we start out with strategic partnerships with major global brands like Pentland. We then get information about uh, their supply chains. With this is uh, in some cases confidential. In some cases, it's already disclosed, uh, open. Uh, and then we access businesses, the suppliers at local level, uh, and we uh, get to talk to the workers to do the outreach. We talk to the management and the HR of the businesses and so on. And through that, uh, we generate a lot of information. So the workers start to call back. They start to report back and so on. And we uh, have a dialogue with the businesses. Then from that process, we identify issues and challenges. And then we work on the solutions. And what is different is like uh, we also go back and actually call the workers. So we return calls to workers to ask whether solutions have improved after we address them with the suppliers and so on. So we have a continuous kind of uh, monitoring and follow-up as well uh, that focus on remediation. And that, again, should hopefully res uh, improve uh, results both for businesses and for the workers on the ground. So... That could look like some of this, like a lot of uh, a mix of technology, as I mentioned, that we use new innovative uh, technology to do this, but also a lot of uh, human outreach and people on the ground. And uh, my colleague Cha Cha will talk a little bit more about that. So our impact, uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, we caught just a couple of years old. Uh, so this is kind of a new approach, and we also different from auditing. Uh, and maybe we can have a debate about that later if, if we have time. Uh, but uh, as you see, like we are now covering like uh, uh, in the ILM approach here, we have like 100,000 workers included. Uh, we got uh, 17 strategic global brands uh, on board. We got 90 Thai suppliers, uh, some of them quite big businesses. And we got like a lot of followers uh, on Facebook and social media who can report on, to us on some of the issues we address. Then we also um, uh, bring together businesses for, at different levels. So we have a global forum. Last year in November, we had a global forum on ethical sourcing. And we will have another one uh, again end of the year. Uh, we don't have the date right now, but we bring together uh, global brands, local businesses, recruitment agencies, uh, governments, and so on, NGOs and other stakeholders to discuss some of these issues to improve the conditions and to uh, share new technological-based uh, technology approaches to address uh, these issues and to improve and mainly manage the risk of uh, forced labor, modern slavery, etc. So this is in very brief our model. And uh, with that, uh, because we have limited time, I'd like to invite my colleague Cha Cha, who is the director of our new Myanmar office, up to talk about like what we do in Myanmar and also on our ethical recruitment uh, program, which is quite new. Yeah. Please, Cha Cha. Thank you so much uh, for, our, uh, for giving the Myanmar as a source country to come and present what we are doing on the source side of the, like when looking at the whole supply chain. Uh, I've been working in counter-trafficking since 2000, 2001, so it's about 17 years of working this area, but working with the business is very new, uh, new but um, it, it's really kind of uh, empowering because I've been working with uh, World Vision and UNIP and kind of Australian funded project, ASEAN project, which is very much looking into the policy, working with the government, civil society organization, but not much with the business. But when my motivation is going down and seeing that all this slavery and human trafficking, it's, it cannot stop and it's growing and f like that, like I see the hope after working with Isra by having all these global brands and retailers and supplier, how the business can influence and how as an NGO is working with the workers can also influence the um, 
can also make the business to make more informed decision and to empower workers in a much better way. Um, so uh, let me start off my uh, kind of uh, my presentation uh, with one of the visits that I have, uh, like I visited. I joined Itzera back in 2016, and then uh, that was my first visit to a factory in, in Thailand. And then when we had this kind of supply chain discussion, and then the factory, the factory management said that uh, when talking about the ethical recruitment, the contract that workers do not understand, and then uh, how people are being recruited, all these problems rec reported by the workers. So we, we looked at together, and then the factory manager management said that, oh, we have all these contracts. The workers on one hand said they do not have, they have never signed the contract, but the factory said, oh, here is the contract where all you have all these workers sign the contract. So as a person coming from Myanmar who know how the, the procedures of the recruitment, how the contracts are being signed, how the recruitment agencies are uh, like managing the workers, I asked, I, I looked at the contract and I found out that these are the contracts. So I asked the workers, when did you sign the contract? And like based on the information that we already gathered from the workers, we identified that these contracts are not being signed in a proper location, in the proper setting, and not it is not their signature. And so we can tell them, based on the information from workers, we can say that, okay, this is not the contract. The, the contract should be signed in this and this location at the presence of the Ministry of Labor and the recru recruitment agency, but it is not that way. So I think the source side information is very important. So where I see the benefit, the Israel see the benefit of engaging, having the, um, the office and the team working in the uh, country of origins in order to kind of help the whole process of supply chain up to before the workers are making decision to come to uh, any of the factory. So, uh, so when talking about, and we feel like we, it's a put ethical recruitment as the priority uh, because we realized that many of the problem that workers face or the factory, the supplier face in the supply chain is because of these uh, all these problems that caused by the recruitment process and the recruitment agencies, both formal and informal, the recruitment uh, recru recruiters. Um, so we we thought that okay, there are many things that we can tackle since the kind of the beginning of the whole uh, journey of the migrant workers, which is the ethical uh, like to have the ethical recruitment. So we try to understand the root causes and underlying factors, understanding the policies and processes of the two governments between Myanmar and Thailand, as well as the international uh, like uh, like how the international conventions are being kind of applied by the recruitment agencies as well as the factory. And we also try to understand the, the behavior and the situation of the job seekers and the migrant workers because they are the one who are making the decision based on what they have been informed and how they interpret and understand. So it is very important to understand uh, like the like their behavior and situation and the challenges faced by the job seekers and workers. And at the same time, we also like um, get like have more and more engagement with the recruitment agencies because there are reasons why rec recruitment agencies are collecting more fees, why the recruitment agencies are acting in a certain way that we do not want them to um, to continue doing because it's caused a lot of problem. So I want to have some of the pictures just to show how we are working in the source side. And this is one of the, uh, um, the recruitment agency of the, um, it's recruiting workers to a supplier going, to, like going to a, a factory, which is in the Penland supply chain. And so this, we see the opportunity like in the source community where workers are hanging out, waiting for the interview, very good, very anxious and excited what they will be interviewed. So the Israel team, not only Israel staff, but the local civil society organization, some of the return uh, migrant workers who are willing to be our ambassadors. And then we, we work together with them and we help them to understand like, like um, the introduce them with uh, our golden dream uh, and write phone applications and also the hotlines that they can call when they arrive to Thailand, which is free. Um, so that workers be empowered and workers be kind of know um, it's a, that they will they have someone to help them along the way. 
And this is where we go through everything and even to understand the, the factory policies. Because many, many factories that we explain to them in the very beginning, the production line, the all these do's and don'ts, and then uh, the working schedules and everything. But we have to understand that not all the workers can understand and grab all these information because they are working in the farm. How can they know that Like they, they can do whenever they want and they can rest and relax in the field after doing the kind of farming? But the setting of the factory is totally different. They do not understand like how to uh, kind of use the, uh, like what is the OT and what is the schedule and why they have to work in the night time and all these shifts. They do not understand, but that's why we cannot assume that by sharing them those information in a leaflet, they can read, but they cannot understand what exactly means. So. For us, based on what we have been gathered from the workers on Thai side, on the challenges that they face on Thai side, working in this industry, this factory, we we know that what are the information that we can offer to the workers before they migrate or even before they make the decision. Um, and so not only we involved in the interview process or pre-departure activity, we also now start thinking by working with the Ministry of Labor how to reach out to a, a wider kind of workers. So this is the location where workers are waiting at the border areas. This is the last the final destination before they cross to Thailand. So there are thousands, every month there are 15,000 workers going to Thailand. And then they are to, like sitting there waiting for the documents, their visa and the smart card to be issued before the, to enter to Thailand. So we see that this is a big opportunity. Like they are waiting for half, half of the day and then we go and introduce them what are the rights, what are the do's and don'ts to live in Thailand. And we also introduce them with our Workers' Voice channel. So that's where we start receiving many, many calls. Another thing is back to the data. We gather all this information based on uh, the, like we build, develop the trust, we empower the workers to contact us, and then ours, we inform them that our Workers' Voice channel hotlines, it is 24 hours, seven days a week, and we keep everything confidential. And then, uh, so they feel safe. They can test from the border. When we do the outreach, they, can, they have already the Thai SIM card, and they start testing the call. So when they test the call, and we, that this is why we continue building trust with them and put them in a, a, a kind of a comfortable situation. So based on that, we, like we now have the, the, the research paper on ethical recruitment for anyone who are interested can look into our website and a financial variable a variable model on ethical recruitment. It took us about six months to a year to really understand what is happening with the whole ethical recruitment process. And then uh, this is the kind of cause and field analysis. But because working with the business and working in the with the recruitment agencies, everyone worried there why I, I'm having to work with the, like the NGO, and is this NGO coming to offer all these code of conducts and things that I have to do, which will affect my profit, uh, profit margin. So we also have to understand how all these recruitment agencies are paying the informal, having to pay the informal fees, how the policy in, it, uh, impacting the whole process that caused them uh, to, to spend more and to have less profit. So when we start talking about ethical recruitment, they say, oh, no. No, no more ethical recruitment. I don't. We don't want to hear about this because we know that it will cost us more and it will affect our profit margin. But we have to kind of build trust again with the ethical recruitment uh, recruitment agency and saying that okay. And at the same time, having the brands and the supplier start asking them about all these things related to the recruitment process. Who are you engaging? Are you engaging such recruitment agency? Some of the factory tell us that we recruit with, uh, like we involve with this recruitment agency. But we checked the list and we found out that this recruitment agencies have been blacklisted or in the kind of the gray list of the government or our CSO partners. So we can inform our business saying that, are you sure that this, this, this person exists or this recruitment agency exists? And then do you want to get hear more about how the recruitment agencies is doing on the source side. So the, the, it's also benefit the, the, the factories in choosing with recruitment agencies that they should be working. 
And these recruitment agency also hear back because they are being asked by the factory, how do they recruit people? How much do they charge? How do they interact with the workers? So like all these information coming from the business and what we kind of ask them and offer them, it's very much kind of they feel like, okay, we need to know what is the global standard? What is the legal kind of compliance? What are the things that the factory want us to do? So they start feeling like it is not a risk, but we need support from the ITZERA. Uh, and though, so that based on that, uh, uh, the we have cost and fees analysis. And when we talk about ethical recruitment, uh, it is not about only zero fees. It's talking about legal compliance, ethical and professional conduct, not a uh, free of charge services. How transparent and ethical term of engagement between recruitment agencies and the factories, and transparent wage deduction and benefit. Healthy, safe. Uh, exploitation, free working and living condition, access to rem uh, remedy and uh, functional grievance mechanisms. So I think this is how the whole model, it's like having both not only working in the, the factory or the so like uh, in the destination, but having engaged the soul side uh, uh, engagement from the ITZERA team as well as the we are engaging with the wider civil society organizations and return migrants. It's how the business can benefit. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.